We start the show in the United States, where the largest rocket ever to lift off the Earth has exploded minutes after takeoff. The giant uncrewed rocket from SpaceX successfully lifted off from the launch pad in Brownsville, Texas. But three minutes into the flight, the Starship capsule failed to separate from the booster. The result was an explosive end for the rocket's first test flight. And we can now bring in Jonathan McDowell. He's an astronomer at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Welcome to DW. Mr. McDowell, a rocket explodes and the company behind it calls it a success. Was it really? Yes, I think it was a qualified success. Uh, uh, in a com this rocket is just a completely new design. It's a real departure from things that have been flown in the past. And so they were not expecting it to be fully successful. You have to debug these things. And, uh, and so it, it, they proved several things. They proved that the engines could fire properly with using this new methane fuel. They proved that the rocket could fly through what's called max Q, the area which is sort of roughest from turbulence, right, that, that could crumple the rocket if it wasn't built strong enough. And they proved it could fly in vaguely the right direction. Uh, it just couldn't separate, uh, fly enough uh, to separate from its upper stage. So, you know, they'll try again in a few months. And uh, there are certainly some serious problems that they had but this gives them something to focus on to fix for next time. Yeah, and the SpaceX employees there, we just saw them cheering after the rocket exploded. Do we know exactly what went wrong? We don't yet, although we do know that several of the 33 booster engines didn't uh, start up. We know that there was more damage than expected to the launch pad, and it's possible that some uh, concrete from the pad flew up and hit the engines. Uh, and then uh, we, there are some suggestions that some hydraulic units exploded about 30 seconds into the flight that may have limited their ability to control the rocket and caused it to spin around and around uh, uh, when it got to the end of its, uh, its first stage. So, um, uh, so there are some clues, but we'll have to wait for the failure investigation to see exactly what went wrong. I don't think anything of these is a real showstopper for the rocket, but it may mean that they have to redesign the launch pad a bit. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, where does that leave the Starship mission? Are we now any closer to the moon or Mars after this launch? I think we are. I, I think that, you know, this is a necessary first step, debugging this rocket, figuring out how to make it fly. Um, I think the hopes of flying to the moon in 2025 with a derivative of this vehicle are maybe a bit optimistic. Uh, I would be really surprised if it's ready by then. But uh, the history of SpaceX has been that it's always taken them longer to, uh, to make things work than they initially hope, but that they plug away at it and they get there in the end. Yeah, how are SpaceX endeavors different at this point from what NASA and ESA, for example, are doing? Right. They are. Well, first is that they're very much more willing to have explosions like this. <laughs> right. It's a much more Silicon Valley software approach where you, you know, you build a bunch of them, you blow a bunch up and you learn as you go. Whereas NASA and ESA are going to, you know, dot every I and cross every T before they uh, start cutting metal and, and, and flying anything. So, so it's a more, um, shall we say, cowboy approach to, to space exploration, but it has been working for them pretty well. Now, when you look at the Falcon 9 rocket that they've been launching, they've launched over 200, and it goes off like clockwork. So um, I, I think you have to distinguish that from you know an early stage development, which is going to have problems. Uh, but if it works, Starship will completely revolutionize space launch. And I'm afraid it will be a big challenge to the European Ariane 6, uh, which is at least one and maybe two generations behind. So if they can get it to work, they're going to dominate the industry. Wow. Astronomer Jonathan McDowell, thank you so much for your insights. Thank you. Now we're joined by Keith Cowie. He's the editor of spaceref.com and joins us from Washington, uh, D.C. Now, do you consider this a success or a failure? Well, it depends which part of the rocket you worked on. For, from my perspective, this was a 400-foot-tall rocket with 30-something engines 
by far the largest rocket anybody has ever built times two or three, depending how you do your math. It took off like a rocket should. I have my high, my high tech graphic here. It went up uh, for several minutes. The engines did their thing. And then the problem happened further up when the second stage or the Starship itself didn't separate. So as a recovering rocket scientist myself, I'd say, wow, we just launched the biggest rocket ever launched and it didn't blow up. As a matter of fact, when it did come apart, that's because they blew it up because they wanted to be certain it didn't come down in the wrong place. Hmm. So, so tell me what successes is, and failures. Okay, so uh, this rocket, biggest rocket ever built, what can it do that other rockets can't? Well, it, it can do two things. One, it can lift more stuff because it's more powerful. But the other thing is, and I've jokingly referred to this as a toaster, this is built in a sort of a consumer-like fashion like you would build airliners. If you were to look at a, a floor where they build airliners, you'd see 50 or 60 of them lined up. Whereas NASA or ESA or any other government space agency tends to build these very expensive rockets that are always delayed and cost billions and so forth. And if you lose one of them, there's a congressional hearing. If you lose one of these, it's in the blooper reel. Now, this may sound like I'm being silly, but when a rocket becomes something that isn't the most expensive part of going to space, it totally changes your way of looking at how to use space. Now, uh, NASA and SpaceX say their long-term goal is to send humans to Mars with rockets like this one. What's the timeline for this? Well, again, it's a sort of like flip a coin. They tend to say, if you're NASA, it used to be the early 2030s, now it's the 2040s. Uh, you know, I, I'm 67. When I grew up, they were saying 1980, so uh, you get used to it. But with SpaceX, it's a private company, so they have a bit of a different way of, you know, guessing on these things, and they may hype it a little bit. But I, I wouldn't be surprised that either the first people to land on Mars land in ships that were built by SpaceX or that ones that NASA or ESA bought from SpaceX. I think that's what's going on here. You're seeing a, a paradigm shift on, on, on re revealing itself in slow motion here. And you have to look at it and say, well, what does this mean? And the answer is, if I could do more things with, with my money, I'm going to do more things mm. with my money. Keith Carrick there, editor of spaceref.com. Always good to have you on the show. Thank you very much, Keith. My pleasure.